Salvation Now podcast, where you'll discover and be equipped with keys from the Word of God that will pave the way to God's unlimited blessing in your life. Now, here's your host, Evangelist TJ Malkanji. Tonight, we're going to be talking about, um, well, essentially, we're going to do a different type of broadcast. It's going to be a Q&A broadcast, more of an interactive broadcast. And so we already have some questions lined up. And we're going to have people asking questions online. So if you have questions online, please put them in the comment section. Those in the studio uh, will be asking questions with Raf, Brother Raf over there. And we're going to have more of an interactive broadcast. And we'll be able to uh, ask questions to Evangelist Tiff, who, by the way, is a champion in evangelism, who's been in it for over 40 years. And uh, he might not like <laughs> uh, the accolades that I attribute to him, but he I mean, he's won over a million people to the Lord in first time decisions for Christ. And he is a champion in evangelism, a perfect example of what an evangelist is um, biblically. And uh, it's it's been a, pre a privilege of evangelist Wesley's and mine to sit under his ministry as Lost Lamb Associate Evangelist and to just learn from him and pull wisdom from him. Uh, it's it's There's no value. I mean, there's no, uh, no amount of money you can put to that. It's a priceless, invaluable asset. And so... Mm. Uh, we're going to hear from the very best tonight, and I'm looking forward to that. Before I pass it over to our, uh, for our first question, which we have lined up, I just wanted to read one scripture just to set the pace for tonight's broadcast out of Romans chapter 10 and verse number 14. Well, let's start with verse number 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And essentially, the job of the evangelist is uh, perfectly summarized right here. Our job is to persuade people through the word of God to see their own sinful depravity uh, before a holy God and let them know that Though we are dead in sin, and though the Bible says we've been confined to um, the prison of sin, that there's a way out. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And whoever calls on me will not perish, but will be saved, and will have access to the Father. And so the Bible says in verse 14, describing the assignment of the evangelist, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring the glad tidings of good things. So the evangelist's job is to present the gospel of peace. The evangelist is sent out. The Bible says there are people that are damned in their sin. And unless they hear, they can't believe. And unless they believe, they can't be saved. And they can't hear without someone preaching. That's our job. And it's the Holy Spirit that sends out people to preach. When you're called to be an evangelist, a call into the full-time ministry, it is the calling of God. It's the Holy Spirit that steers up uh, steers up that call, that, that urgency in people's hearts to answer that call, to respond to that call, to give their life to that holy assignment, to present the gospel of Jesus Christ without charge before the lost masses of this, of this green planet. And so um, I, want, I wanted to hear, and I know Evangelist Wesley uh, does too, I wanted to hear Evangelist Tiff on uh, your thoughts on the biblical role of an evangelist and how important this specific office is as it pertains to the final hour of time as we approach the day of the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church. Well, when I think of the calling of the evangelist, uh, I often think of the evolution of that call. And let me be specific, uh, especially in the Western culture, and uh, I've said this before, and I'm sure I'll say it again, and I hope that it's, it's not considered as critical, but one of the evolutions of the office of the evangelist in the Western culture is that the majority of those who call themselves evangelists that are traveling and preaching are really not evangelists. 
they perhaps might be considered by some to be teachers or revivalists. And I'm not saying that we don't need either of those in the church. But what I'm saying is I think that many younger people who grow up in church, who are recently saved, when they see evangelists, by and large, they're watching people who are going to churches and holding pep rallies for believers. They're really not doing the New Testament work of the office of the evangelist. And my hero in the faith, Dr. Billy Graham, said something when I was a young evangelist, probably younger than you, Brother TJ, or Brother Wesley, but it stuck with me all these years. Dr. Billy Graham said, if you're not winning the lost, you're not an evangelist. And so the first thing that I would do in pointing a flashlight from Scripture upon the divine calling, and of course we know out of Ephesians chapter 4 that God gave five specific New Testament gifts to the church for its building, its encouragement, its correction, and so on. The office of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. But the evangelist primarily is assigned with preaching Christ and calling people to repentance and offering salvation. We only have one example of an evangelist in the New Testament, and his name was Philip. And the Bible tells us in a passage concerning Philip, as he joined himself to the man who was in the chariot searching the scriptures, reading out of Isaiah, and in his mind he thought, I wish I had someone that could explain this to me. And the Bible concerning Philip the evangelist said, and he preached Christ unto him. And so that is the biblical essence of the office of the evangelist, is to preach Christ. And by preaching Christ, we specifically speak of the gospel of Christ. And when we speak of the gospel of Christ, we speak specifically of the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man that separates us from God, and there's only one mediator between man and God, and it is Jesus Christ. The gospel in its simplicity still carries mighty power. And Billy Graham once said, if you take the gospel and you make it simple, the results will be profound. But if you take the gospel and you try to make it profound, the results are often simple. And that is so true, and it's as true in the 21st century as it was in the first century church. The office of the evangelist is to preach Christ to the unsaved, to the unchurched, to the unreached, and call them to a decision to turn from sin and turn to Christ. Graham's quote, that if you make the gospel simple, you'll have profound results, because oftentimes when you see people um, that are addressing a, a crowd of unbelievers, sometimes there's the trap that they get into where they start to um, kind of like try and show off their theological muscles and try and get into deep theological concepts and they're bouncing around the Bible and, and it, it really, they lose the crowd because most people, and I think you addressed this the other night, mm -hmm. uh, most people don't, they don't know three scriptures. Most people have a, a far less understanding of the Bible that we give them or credit them. And, and so one thing I know that you've taught me is like when you're addressing a crowd of unbelievers at a crusade, open your Bible and don't just reference the scripture thinking that everyone knows what you're talking about, uh, especially in Canada where it's almost like a, a post-Christian society and it's become very secularized that we are to open the Bible and actually read the story and take time to pause and read the story, let people um, kind of take it all in. And that's helped me tremendously, is getting to the simplicity of it all. Don't. It's not a time to talk about the difference between Arminianism and Calvinism, or the difference between, uh, you know, 
other theological concepts and stuff and it, just get to the simplicity of things. Because there's people that are there that are attending that crusade that, you know, they, they're feeling the burden of sin. They're feeling the depravity of their soul. They're feeling perhaps they're sick in their body. Perhaps they're depressed. Perhaps their marriage is collapsing. Perhaps that... Uh, you know, there, there's something in their life that's 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 just crashing down, and that's that's where the gospel's power will help them the most. The simple gospel, and Paul said, "I fear like that you would be corrupted from the simplicity of the gospel." And the more we try to kind of amp it up, the less powerful it is. But the more you get to its core principle, the more power is released, brother Wesley. Absolutely, yeah. Um Brother Tiff, something that I was thinking about that I thought would be helpful uh, for a lot of the people that are watching that you've helped me with, and you just kind of mentioned this, but we said last night that all good evangelistic preaching should lead to a point of decision. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, because um, I'm interested in hearing, and uh, I know everyone watching is, if you could kind of give us some insight into some of the biblical defenses of forgiving an altar call, because as you know, and you've taught me, uh, in some of uh, modern Christianity, uh, Christianity, there's an attack on the altar call, yeah. but there's defenses in the Bible for giving an altar call. So if you could kind of touch on that, and then also the importance of that being a public decision, calling people out of their seats forward to an altar uh, to make the decision to repent of sin and uh, give their life to Jesus Christ, I think that'd be a great help to us. Well, well once again, uh, any question should be brought back to the integrity of the Bible and shouldn't be brought into uh, the lens of an opinion or a denomination or a certain sect of thinking. Uh, what do we see in the Bible? And I actually have a, a teaching that I make available to evangelists and pastors for free and would be happy to do so for those that are watching this broadcast. Uh, years ago, when Central Bible College was still in existence, which was the uh, founding and premier Assembly of God Ministerial School in Springfield, Missouri. I had been asked under President Lednecki uh, to speak on the subject of giving an evangelistic invitation. And so I had prepared a, a message and I had uh, three one-hour sessions to teach on it. And so I was given ample time. So uh, if you'll allow me, I'll not give you the three-hour course. I'll give you the cliff notes and a handful of points. But when we look at the Bible, the very first invitation to the very first sinner was Adam in the book of Genesis. It predates the apostolic church by quite some period of time. And when I teach on the evangelistic invitation, I literally walk people from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, and there's a commonality in how the invitation is given. We see it first with Adam. When Adam sinned, he felt the guilt of his sin, the condemnation of his sin, the weight of his sin, and he, along with his wife Eve, hid themselves in the garden. But the mistake was, you can't hide from God. God knows all. God sees all. And God confronted him. And when God came into the garden, the scripture says, instead of playing hide and go seek, he simply came into the garden and said, Adam, where art thou? Now, what was God doing? He knew exactly where Adam and Eve were, because you can hide from God. He was requiring Adam, number one, to acknowledge his sin. Number two, to acknowledge his hiding. And three, to acknowledge his need to make things right. And what was the protocol that we see out of that? We see God calling Adam personally and publicly. We could go to the Mount of Baal with the prophet of God calling fire down as he's in a direct challenge with the priests of Baal. And before he called the fire down, there's a scripture tucked in there that's often overlooked. Before the prophet of God called the fire down upon the altar, he said, those who are on the Lord's side, come stand here with me. And then we could walk into the New Testament. Everybody Jesus called, he called personally 
and he called publicly, just like God did in the garden, just like the prophet did there with the prophets of Baal. And then in the book of Acts, every single apostolic sermon, they called the people out personally and publicly. And Jesus actually said with the words of his own mouth, found in the book of Luke in the 12th chapter, he said in the New Living Translation, it reads, if you confess me openly or publicly, uh, depending upon which NLT you're reading from, the original says, if you confess me publicly before men, I will confess you openly before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father and the angels. And so without going into the depth of all of the other passages that support that, you'll just have to trust me on this point. There's one theme, there's one protocol, there's one commonality in dealing with sin and coming into the forgiveness of God. And that is you have to make a personal and a public commitment to Christ. Every time I give an invitation, and by the way, let me throw this in. I don't give an invitation when I'm done preaching. I give an invitation before I start. What do you mean before you start? When I'm introduced, I'll oftentimes say, there are many of you that are here tonight that perhaps this is all new to you. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe you've never been to church. Maybe you're feeling awkward. But I do want to ask you a very specific question. If the Lord were to come tonight, are you living ready to meet the Lord? Not all of you could answer that with a firm yes. I want you to know that as I speak tonight, before I'm done, I'm going to give you an opportunity in case you've never had anyone who's loved you enough to give you an opportunity to make peace with God. And if you don't know how to make peace with God, I'm going to carefully explain that tonight as well. And then I might, as I'm preaching, pause two, three, four, five, sometimes more. I'll pause and I'll say something like, in the moments ahead, I'm going to give you an opportunity to turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Christ. And I'm continually giving the invitation throughout my evangelistic message. So by the time I get to the end of my time, they already know exactly what I'm going to do. And then I call the people publicly and personally. And I'll oftentimes tell them everything we do in life that has significance, we do it personally and we do it publicly. We marry our spouse personally and publicly. We graduate from school personally and publicly. Our degrees in higher education are conferred upon us publicly and personally. We honor war heroes personally and publicly. We inaugurate presidents personally and publicly and so on. And I walk them through the significance of the decision that they're about to make. Uh, if you're taking notes, let me give you three things that every evangelistic message should do. Every evangelistic message should make a person think. You should be challenging them because you can challenge the mind. You can show them reasons why you believe the Bible. You can lay out apologetics so that people can intellectually understand that this is not all a matter of blind faith. There are intellectual reasons why we believe in the integrity of the Scripture, why we believe in the resurrection of Christ, and so on. Every sermon should make a person think. Every sermon should make a person feel. Sometimes people uh, attack uh, Charismatics or Pentecostals or people who preach and teach with a passion, but the gospel reaches into a man's heart. The gospel reaches into a woman's heart. It should not only touch their mind, it should touch their seat of emotions and passion, and it should make them feel. And then lastly, it should make them decide. You should always call people to a very specific decision, and that decision that you're calling them to is to turn from sin and turn to Christ 
and you shouldn't wait until your conclusion to make that real to them. The invitation for the evangelist is from beginning and woven throughout the message and then given that final opportunity at the end of the time that you're sharing with your audience in calling them clearly to Christ. And every single example from Genesis to the book of Revelation, the commonality is they were always called personally and they were always called publicly. I detest these modern soft invitations where pastors oftentimes say, we're not going to make a spectacle out of you. We're not gonna ask you to come forward right where you're standing, right where you're sitting. You don't even have to pray out loud. You can just think it in your head and God knows every sincere thought. Camouflage altar calls produce camouflage Christians. And in a day and an age in which everything under the sun has come out of the closet, we dare not try to soft sell the preciousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be raising up men and women of God who have strength and humility and integrity, who stand firm for the gospel. As the apostle said, I am not ashamed of the gospel Hallelujah. of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Praise Thank you, God. Lord. Praise God. One of the things, I, I think it's in your CD, the theology to a biblical invitation, uh, that you mentioned that in a very high end restaurant, like a Michelin star restaurant, whenever you take your order and they come out with the menus and they, they collect your order, the waitress or the waiter, uh, in a high end restaurant, that they'll actually bring a plate that has all the desserts on it. And before you've even eaten your first appetizer, there's already all the desserts that they're wetting your appetite to save room for it at the end. And they're preparing you for it so that, you know, you don't overeat uh, during your main meal and there's room for dessert. And it obviously adds more money to their pockets and it adds more calories to our bodies. But <laughs> uh, I think that 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 analogy that you gave in that CD really helped me um, in implementing that in my own meetings and we we do implement that in our meetings and i'm telling you it, it it does make a difference everything this man has said i know evangelist wesley and myself we've implemented it and it makes a great difference yeah. an amazing difference uh, i've seen when i've done uh events where i just kind of like tagged it on I, I tagged it on at the end i forgot you know mm. throughout my service to do it and the altar calls not as as um, profound in results as when I begin my night yeah. by getting people re ready. You're priming the people, and then when you give that call, there's no surprise. There's no, oh my gosh, I got to think, am I going to go up tonight? No, there's, I've had right. enough time now to meditate on this decision right. and go out. Right, and, and it's, uh, it's effective. Like something that uh, Brother Tiff taught me is that your call to decision should always be a forethought, not an afterthought. Yeah. You should be thinking about it as you're going into your meeting and being prepared. My goal in this service is to win lost men, That's right. lost women, lost boys, lost girls to Jesus Christ. And uh, something that uh, I learned from him is that when you make your altar call clear, you make it pointed, and you let people know, as, as uh, Evangelist Tiff just said, what I'm asking you to do tonight, this is what I'm asking you to do. If it's clear and not like a muddy altar call, then people know when they're coming forward, I'm repenting of sin, I'm becoming a Christian, and my life's never going to be the same after Amen. this night. And the reason I said that is it works. It's effective. People, and this is the thing is that, uh, that I've noticed a lot, especially for some of the younger evangelists, some of the things that I've dealt with on the road, and I've talked to Brother Tiff about this and to uh, Brother TJ as well, is that you need to take a stand for the altar call and the public call to Christ. It doesn't matter what anybody else has to say. That's right. If it's in the Bible, it works. As we said last night, I know the Bible is right and somebody's wrong. Amen. So we do these things because it's a biblical method and they work. People come to Christ. Can That's you right. say amen? amen? We have a question for you, Evangelist Tiff, uh, someone in studio that we'll show you on the screen. What, what does he see on his end? Is it just us? Or he's going to see them? Okay, so we have someone in studio that uh, would like to ask a question. Uh, state your name, what your question is. Oh, put it up. Name and question. So my name is McKelly, and my question is, um, when you preach, do you point out other religions? 
repeat that question to me one more time. So basically what I want to know is when you preach, do you point out other religions, like example, uh, Islam? Like do you, do you do a comparison between Christianity and Islam or Buddhism? Not in every message, but uh, I do often. Uh, for example, uh, just uh, I was recently preaching and I'm, I made the comment that many people are very angered and very triggered when they hear Christians say that there's only one way to have a right relationship with God, and that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps we've all seen on talk shows or on debates or on the news or on media, people just become incensed. How can you as a Christian, of all of the people in the world, of all of the cultures, of all of the civilizations, of all of the untold numbers of religions and philosophies and faiths, how do you as a Christian dare have the audacity to say that your God, your Jesus, your gospel is the only way to God? And they're incensed by that, and the average Christian doesn't know how to answer that. And I oftentimes will say, you are saying, in other words, that Christianity is exclusive, that we preach an exclusive gospel, and that Christ is the only way to God, is an exclusive truth. But every major religion in the world, Muslims, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Christian, etc., Every major religion in the world claims exclusivity. That's right. They all say that their way is the only way. That's right. What separates Christianity from all world religions is not only the Bible, because people could say the Bible is the sacred writings of Christians, but we have sacred writings too. We have prophets too. We have holy men too. But what they don't have is they don't have a resurrected Christ. Amen. And the, resurrected is and the second thing they don't have is this Bible is almost one third prophetic. It contains almost one third content called Bible prophecy. And over 80% of those prophecies have been fulfilled. No other religion in the world has prophecy, and no other religion in the world has a resurrected founder. Christianity alone has a resurrected Hallelujah. Christ, and we have a provable Bible, and we have the apologetic of eschatology, which is Bible prophecy woven throughout. I think of Enoch, seven generations hmm. after the creation of Adam. Think of it. Enoch, seven generations in, prophesied about the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, early in civilization, seven generations in, Enoch prophesied about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is found throughout the Old and New Testament alike. We have a resurrected Christ and we have a provable Bible. Thank you. No other world religion. And again, every major world religion claims exclusivity. But it's Christianity that's always attacked, saying you as Christians claim exclusivity. No, every major religion in the world claims exclusivity because truth is exclusive. The very nature of truth is it's exclusive. Right. One plus one equals two. It is an exclusive truth that is unchangeable, and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the integrity of the Bible and the content of Bible prophecy separates Christianity from every major religion in the world. And every evangelist should be well-versed in apologetics, and mm. that's simply a theological word that means the ability to give an answer to those who ask of you. 
And that's why I said earlier, every evangelistic message should make somebody think, should make somebody feel, and should make somebody decide. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Brother Tiff, a uh, question that I think um, is important for us to ask you, and kind of it came up in your response there. You've been preaching on the subject of eschatology and Bible prophecy for over 40 years. As you often say, uh, your desire is to become a trusted voice in the lives of believers in the realm of Bible prophecy. And uh, in my mind, and in uh, TJ's mind, you're an authority in this subject. Something you taught me is that in the last days, Bible prophecy and your ability to handle it and to preach it is going to become very important in evangelistic preaching. And every evangelist should be able to preach Bible prophecy, understand it, and use it as a tool to call in the lost. So I wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit to that and just elaborate for the audience on the power of Bible prophecy as it pertains to effective evangelism in the final hours of human history. Well, if you were to uh, do a historic study of great evangelists that God has used through the years, one of the things that you would discover is that almost without exception, they all were students of eschatology and preached on Bible prophecy. Uh, again, my hero in the faith, Billy Graham, in almost every single crusade that Billy Graham had around the world, he would announce a night that he was going to preach on Bible prophecy. <laughs> and his uh, large crusades sometimes were three nights or four nights some were longer, some of the historic crate crusades, for example, in Wembley Stadium in England went six weeks. His uh, revival in Madison Square Garden uh, went for months. But I think that in these last days, people are beginning to see world conditions and they're beginning to see them with the thought of, hey, Maybe we shouldn't throw Bible prophecy out so quickly. And I think the pandemic actually accelerated that. In fact, I know it did. Mm. Uh, that's actually when I started my YouTube channel on a regular basis. And when the pandemic hit and brought the entire world to its knees, I had about 40 of my meetings canceled in about 10 days to two weeks. Wow. And everybody was nervous. We were being told this could be worse than the Spanish flu. We were being told that in North America, we could see five to 10 million people who would die in a matter of months and so on. And so there was an initial time there when the world literally was driven to its knees in it's fear and wondering what's next. I took three days to fast and pray and I've said this often, I'll say it again tonight. Anytime you're in ministry, when you come to a plateau or you come to a pause or you come to uh, what might seem to be uh, an impassable place, set aside time to fast and pray. That's good. And on those three days of fasting and prayer, I felt, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I felt very strongly in my spirit and it grew throughout the three days of fasting and prayer. I want you to preach and teach on Bible prophecy more than what you're doing. I distinctly remember almost feeling insulted in my flesh because I was already known as an evangelist who preached on eschatology <laughs> in almost every single meeting. Yeah. But I learned a long time ago, don't argue with the promptings of the Lord. And so I began a YouTube channel. I had convinced myself for whatever reason that social media was for people 30 years old and younger and that I was a, a dinosaur and that really had passed me by. But one of the things that I found out as I began to do YouTube and specifically focusing initially almost exclusively every message on Bible prophecy and what I did which is what I do now. I pay attention to the questions that unsafe people are asking me. That's good. If you look at my content on YouTube, there's over 400 videos. 
Not one single video that's up there is something that I personally have felt led to speak on, so to speak. Hmm. Almost without exception, every single video is a question that has been sent in to Lost Lamb. And I have a, a young lady on staff by the name of Sarah who actually keeps track of trending questions and things that come in. And our YouTube videos answer from the Bible the questions of people that are coming in. Now, a lot of it is Bible prophecy. I will tell you this. People are living with feelings of hopelessness. People in our society are living one paycheck to the next. We have not fully recovered from the extreme mandates and how it affected work ethic, how it affected our economy, how it affected capitalism, the debate that goes on continually about socialism and so forth. Our world has been forever changed, but people almost inherently know whether they're Christians or agnostics or atheists or unbelievers, people seem to have a sixth sense that something's not right in the world. And they're seeing sure. things that are happening, especially when it comes to the advancement of cashless society. Mm. And there have been movies about the mark of the beast. There have been movies about the Antichrist. There have been movies in Hollywood, best-selling movies, about the end of the age and so forth. And when Amazon came out recently with the ability to purchase with your hand going into a scanner, people begin to ask more questions <laughs> about the mark of the beast. And I could go down through a litany of questions that come in. But if there ever were a time, I've been in evangelism for almost 50 years, I've preached in crusades in over 60 countries of the world. I have never seen a hunger for Bible prophecy like I've seen in the last five to 10 years. And by God's grace, because I don't have the technology to explain it to an audience, we now have through YouTube almost a million students a month who study the Bible oh, with us at least once a month in over a hundred nations of the world, and it's producing salvations and recommitments like a river that isn't stopping. The current of salvations and recommitments continues to grow and grow and grow. And a lot of that is because I found the lane led by God to begin to teach on difficult questions and to teach on Bible prophecy and that audience is growing, uh, I guess, somewhere around 60 to 70% of people don't bother to subscribe to your channel. But we continue to grow at a pace of about five to 8,000 subscribers a month without any real push. And uh, I, I tie that directly to the evangelistic message mm -hmm. of eschatology and dealing with Bible prophecy and creating what I call, what I hope to be, a trusted voice. I don't do clickbait. I don't swim in the pool of stupidity. <laughs> I open the Bible and I teach people what God said and try to explain it to them in a way that even their children can understand. That's awesome. And you can see the hand of God all over it because of its growth. And uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a person on YouTube that has a bigger audience when it comes to eschatology. There's people that have more subs, maybe, but I'm, like per, view, per video views, you have videos with 3 million, 5 million, uh, and, and beyond that. And it's been amazing. I know that you even have to build a new studio now and a uh, call, uh, call center just to handle all the people that are getting saved, all the people that are writing in to the ministry. It has literally uh, changed the reach of the ministry. I'll tell you a quick story that might encourage you guys as young evangelists. And by the way, uh, both TJ and uh, Wesley, I consider not only spiritual sons, but I hold them under the banner of Lost Lamb Association as an associate evangelist and couldn't be more proud. You guys are doing an amazing job. You're so far ahead 
of where I was uh, at your age in many, many ways. And I know God has great things for your future in store, and it'll just get better and better. Amen. But when I was your age, if not a little younger, I was preaching in uh, right outside Western Port, Maryland. I was preaching an Assembly of God family camp under a tent, and the speaker's cabin uh, was musty and uh, <laughs> unpleasant and used very little. But I remember getting up early in the morning, and I was frustrated. And the reason I was frustrated was I felt called to win a million people to Christ, and I was being invited to speak at all of these Christian events where there were no unbelievers to get saved, and it was getting frustrating. I'd have a week of meetings, and there wouldn't be a single sinner that would even come into the meetings, let alone get saved, or I'd mm -hmm. see one saved after a week of meetings. And, you know, it was just frustrating to me. I thought, I'll never reach a thousand souls, let alone a million at this pace. And I remember praying and asking God for wisdom and direction and, you know, how am I going to do this? And I specifically remember praying almost word for word this prayer. And I remember uh, I was already in prayer. I was in the room by myself. No one could hear me. But I remember the tears running down my face and dripping off my chin and having my hands up and saying, oh, God. Oh, that there were a microphone that I could speak into that would touch the ears of unsaved, unchurched, unreached people Hallelujah. around the world. Little did I know that prayer was premature, but it was prophetic because I now am able to sit in our Law Slam studio and to teach. And often that's what I do. I sit in my chair with a Bible, and I just, in my mind, I imagine that that unsafe person that sent that question is sitting on the other side of the lens with a cup of coffee. And I, in my mind, just imagine talking to someone that I'm having a coffee with. I don't scream at them. I don't yell. I don't raise my voice. I talk to them as if they're a friend on the other side of that lens. Now, if you've heard me preach, I do my fair share of raising my voice. I do my fair share of preaching with the fire of God. I, I've finished many a message with my suit wet and my <laughs> eyes wet with tears. And I, I, I believe in passion and I have passion. And I yes. try to train all of our evangelists that are under umbrella that you need to have fire and passion. But when God gave me direction for the YouTube channel, that's what I felt like God asked me to do. I felt like God said, here's your microphone. And on the other side of that lens is an unsaved world. Just reason with them. The Bible said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And I think for a lot of people that knew me and knew our ministry, it was a side of Tiff Shuttlesworth that they had never seen before, mm -hmm. where I literally just sat down in a chair and opened up a Bible and said, today, I'm going to be answering the question that just came in. Where did Cain get his wife? Which is a YouTube <laughs> video I did about two weeks ago. And, you know, it's a simple question. But, you know, that video in a couple of weeks is already approaching a quarter of a million views. Who would have thought that questions as basic and as simplistic as questions like those would reach such an audience. But everything that I preach on ends with an invitation. Yeah. Because when I teach on Cain, for example, Cain is an example. The Bible said that through his sin, he was discarded from the holiness of God because holiness and sin and rebellion cannot habitate the same place. And the Bible said that Cain left to the Garden of Eden and journeyed east to a place called Nod. Cain is a type of a rebellious person, a person who doesn't want God, who doesn't want his presence, who doesn't respect his authority, who's walking in their own path. Abel, on the other hand, 
is an example of a man who understood righteousness right. and the shedding of blood and the holy sacrifice, etc. So it doesn't matter what you're teaching on. The gospel of Jesus Christ is bridged into every single teaching. And so some people might see when they see the titles of the questions, man, these are really simplistic or these are so basic. But it's actually been a reminder to me that that's where the world is that needs Christ. They literally know nothing about the Bible and their questions are sincere and simple. And if you respectfully answer them from the integrity of the Bible, you can take any path in the Bible right. and find your way to the cross and to salvation. And that is what we endeavor to do. And I've lived long enough to have, you know, and it varies. Some months are less than a million. Some months are well over a million. As I mentioned, we just had a, a, a teaching on where did Cain get his wife in a handful of days that's already over a quarter of a million uh, views. I preached in a little rural church, not on my YouTube channel, on their YouTube channel, when Benjamin Netanyahu had declared war in Israel, uh, the pastor called me and said, listen, I normally don't ask any of my guests and tell them what to preach, but in light of the fact that they've gone to war in Israel and you understand Bible prophecy, would you take time to address that? And again, not on my YouTube channel, on that little rural church's YouTube channel, that Sunday morning message had over a million views in less than three days, and now is almost at two million views. So I want to encourage uh, those that are listening, regardless of where you're at, maybe you're not even in ministry yet, regardless of whether you're young or old or somewhere in between, we live in a day where you can sit with a microphone and a camera and literally touch the world. Right. And if you would have told me there would come a day that there would be over a million people a month from over a hundred nations of the world that would study the Bible with us each and every month, it would have seemed impossible. But that's what God is doing in these last days and more. Exceedingly, Hallelujah. abundantly, above all, we're able to ask for Praise you. God. And I hope that stretches your faith because I know it stretches mine. You know, one thing you mentioned as you told that testimony uh, before, where you were at a church and you were frustrated and you prayed that prayer, you said that um, your goal was to lead a million people to Jesus Christ in first time decisions. And you've exceeded that uh, in recent times. I mean, it took you quite a while to get to about 600,000. And then in the last handful of years, you've uh, far exceeded that, which is awesome. And it shows the acceleration of uh, God on the earth and the work that he wants done as Jesus' return is, is nigh. Um, I see that throughout biblical history, there's a pattern. And you see Isaiah having an encounter with God and then it giving him a message and a burden for his generation. I see Jeremiah uh, having an encounter with God and the Lord touching his mouth and saying, I've put my word in your mouth. Now go and, tell, uh, go and say what I tell you to say. Don't be afraid of their faces. I'm with you to deliver you. And that dispatched him and launched him out into the ministry. I see Moses having an encounter with the fire of God at that, um, in, that, in that desert where uh, the burden for the children of Israel was not only imparted, but the Bible says that he ended up leading, leading a nation out of uh, slavery and Egyptian bondage, and all these calls began at a defining moment in their life where they had an encounter with a holy God in a very real way. Uh, if you look at Peter and John and James and Andrew and most of the disciples, we see their stories where they had a supernatural encounter with Jesus, and it left it caused them to leave their boats and their fishing businesses and their tax collecting businesses and they left everything to follow him and even when he in John 6 began to talk about some uh, very deep things that turned many people off and a lot of people stopped following Jesus uh, because he, to many he was deemed demon possessed or a lunatic 
And he turned to the disciples and said, are you going to leave me also? And Peter piped up, and one of the few times he said something good, and said, where can we go? You hold the words of eternal life. And he knew that because of Luke 5, when he had that encounter where the catch of fish came in, and he fell to his knees and said, I'm a sinful man, depart from me. So we see all these encounters that led to calls. Can you point back to a moment in your life where you had a definite encounter with God that embedded something in your heart to pursue that goal to reach a million people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, to stick through it through all the years, to stick to that through the years, to not deviate. That's, that's a grace. And there's something special. And so I know that there's that story in 1978, if you care to share that, but can you point back to that defining moment where all of that was birthed in your life? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before I do so, I think it's important for your audience to understand that not everybody has the same call and not everybody has uh, a dramatic call. Uh, I recently at uh, North Point Bible College, where I serve as president, I, when I'm there, I devote an entire week of chapels to a theme as opposed to just preaching a different message every day. I try to take a theme for the entire week and drive it home. Sure. And I just recently uh, did an entire week of chapels on the call of God. And in the Bible, we see what I called the dramatic call of God. And the dramatic call of God was illustrated with Saul, where Saul was persecuting the church. And then as he's riding his horse he literally has a head-on collision with the power of god where god knocks him off of his horse renames him a prophecy has carried him to a place of instruction he's trained personally by god in three uh, years of wilderness biblical training ministry training apostolic training so on you know i call that the dramatic call of god some people have a dramatic call of god but there are other people who have what I call the progressive call of God. That would seemingly be best seen by the disciples because the disciples, even as they're hand-picked by Christ, being hand-trained and mentored by Christ, walking personally with Christ, being eyewitnesses to his ministry and his signs and his wonders and his miracles and so forth, they don't get it. And you can see that they're going through an evolution without fully understanding that they're the 12 apostles and they're fighting over who's going to sit where and who's going to be exalted. And they don't even know that the kingdom of God is not on earth at that time and so forth. And so with the apostles, even though they were walking in intimacy with Christ, there's no others. Their call of God was progressive. It finally came to them where the light went on, primarily after his death and his burial and his resurrection, before they finally understood the call of God and what it was that they had been trained to do. And then there's the call of God from birth. We could talk about Jeremiah, while yet in his mother's womb, John the Baptist, while in his mother's womb, etc. So before I say what happened to me, uh, I want to just be sure that nobody feels like you have to have my experience sure. because there are a multitude of ways that God imparts his calling. Now, for me, it was partially progressive because as I grew up as a pastor's son in the church, I was oftentimes moved in a different way when my father would have missionaries in. And I'm talking about real missionaries. Not everybody that calls themselves a missionary is a missionary, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but I would have those times in services where missionaries came and told their stories and pioneered in jungles and the Congo and the prices that were paid. And, you know, one of them I remember very well, uh, David Lubbock, his daughter attacked in school and stabbed, I think, with 30-some pencils as the only white girl in the Congo. And all of those pencils were broken off in her body. And 
almost died of lead poisoning. And, you know, one of my first dates, so to speak, as a teenage boy, I took uh, that missionary's daughter out for pizza one night. Primarily, I wasn't romantically interested in her. I wanted to hear her story. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear those stories about pencils being broken off in your body and being attacked and almost dying from lead poisoning, etc. But <laughs> my call of God, though I felt something inside right up through my teen years that seemingly like the apostles got stronger. I had a dramatic call of God in the prayer room at Zion Bible Institute. Uh, back in those days where uh, my mom and dad attended, my mom and dad actually met on the original campus of Zion in 1949, the fall. Wow. Uh, they had four sons, Ted, Tim, Tiff, and Terry. I'm the third of four boys. All of us attended there. All of us met our spouses there except Terry. Uh, my youngest brother indirectly met his wife there. My son Jonathan went there. My daughter went there. Pastor Steve went there. Uh, Adalis went there. That school really impacted my life. And in the prayer room, we were in a, a true revival. And I'll not take the time to describe all of that revival. But there was a real spirit of prayer for about two weeks. And in the prayer room, and people were praying so loud you couldn't hear yourself. It was a small prayer room. That's the awesome. rules at the school where the girls prayed on one side, the guys prayed on the other. But you literally couldn't hear yourself pray. It was like a volume of people calling out to God without fear, without intimidation. And all of a sudden, above everybody's noise, I heard somebody cry with a loud voice, Oh God, a million souls. And then I heard it a second time, and it was the second time that I specifically remember it was me. I was the one who was crying above everybody's voice, asking God for a million souls. And it's amazing how quickly you can go from lost in the spirit of prayer to carnal flesh. But I went from lost in the spirit of prayer to carnal flesh in a millisecond wow. because I immediately shut down when I realized it was me asking for a million souls. And I remember the thought going through my mind, what are you saying? What are people going to think? People are going to think you have an ego or people are going to think you think more highly of yourself than what you should. Hmm. and But it was so real and so branded into my spirit. Now I know as a specific calling like Saul had, I took my Bible and I had a piece of paper. It was yellow. And I wrote down on that paper, my goal is to lead one million people to Jesus Christ. And I tucked that in my Bible I don't remember, but I almost think I wrote down the time and the date when I had that encounter with God. Mm -hmm. I've always hoped that going through my Bibles and my old books that one day I'd find it because I know I kept it and didn't throw it out. But I never told anybody that, TJ, till I was 38 years old. Wow. I hid that in my heart for over 20 years. And as the Lord began to bless the ministry and, you know, many years later, we went through the legal process of legally incorporating Lost Lamb Association. Uh, that's actually in the opening statement of our legal charter. I made a couple of subtle changes to it. With time, I, I felt uncomfortable with uh, my goal is to lead one million people to Jesus Christ. I, I just felt, I'm, and I'm not saying it's wrong if somebody does it this way, that's between them and the Lord, but I didn't like it starting with me, my. Mm -hmm. So when you look at our actual Lost Lamb Association legal charter, it has a subtle change and it reads this way. Independence upon God, comma, our goal because I realized by the time I was 38 that this wasn't something that one person could do. It was something that a ministry and a team of people would do. And uh, 
Now, perhaps God has put me in as the quarterback or as the main voice, but the truth is uh, Judy's a part of it. Our ministry staff at Lost Lamb is a part of it. Our Lost Lamb partners all over the world are a part of it. And so it legally says in our charter, independence upon God, our goal is to lead one million people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And only heaven keeps perfect records, but it seems that social media pushed us across that line of exceeding a million first-time decisions for Christ. Uh, those things are, are difficult to quantify, but I think conservatively, we passed that uh, through social media. I've changed it now. Uh, independence upon God, our goal is to lead 10 million people Amen. to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've asked the Lord if Jesus carries and if I have the strength uh, to serve him all the days of my life, that somehow, just as he miraculously took me past the million, I'm asking him for 10 million more. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Before, I know uh, Brother Wesley has a question here, but before I do that, if you're in studio and you have another question, just go and see Raph right here. If you're online uh, watching right now and you have a question for Evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth, please put that in the comments. Um, I, read, I read one com uh, question before, which I'm going to circle back on, but before we do that, uh, Brother Wesley. Yeah, you want me to go ahead? Yeah. I was thinking today, um, Brother Tiff, about some of the things that you've said to me over the years that have helped me. And it came to my memory what you had told me that there's two things that God uh, uses when it comes to advancement, increasement, and min uh, increasing in ministry, like two tracks on a railroad, I guess you'd say track, right? Two tracks on a uh, railroad track, holiness and humility. And something that you told me that I think will help a lot of young guys just starting out, and because it helped me, you had, told, you had said something to me, Wesley, God is more concerned with building you than he is with building your ministry. And I'll be honest, I didn't fully understand what you meant when you told me that, that at the time, but over the last couple of years, I think this was about three or four years ago that you had said that, I've started to realize the importance of humility and character and building a credible reputation, the importance of those things starting in evangelism. So I think it'd be important and helpful to the audience if you could speak a little bit to that especially when starting out in ministry, fresh out of Bible school, the importance of that? Well, I'll preface my remarks by saying I've often wondered uh, how humble is it to teach people about humility? But nonetheless, uh, I hope I wrap this in, in humility because I, I surely mean it uh, to come from a place. And, and by the way, Wesley, I'm uh, so very proud of you and uh, because uh, from what I've seen I, I think you at a very young age uh, embraced that those of you that are watching may not know this but uh, Wesley actually gave his heart to Christ in a lost lamb crusade in Massachusetts uh, I think you were what 14 15 14 14 years old and if I remember the details uh, I actually went over to you and laid hands on you and prophesied that God was going to call you into evangelism. Is that correct? 100% correct. So, uh, you know, being in this evangelism summit with TJ and Wesley is special to me in, in uh, many, many ways. But sadly, and I, I, I want to be careful with this because I, I really do want this to be wrapped in grace and, and humility. But sadly, we live in a day and an age where social media is an incredible opportunity for ministry and an incredible platform with limitless opportunities afforded to us. But so many people, I think in ministry, cross that line where their social media really has become like the Kardashians, where it's self-promotion mm. and self-aggrandizement. And I think we need to be careful 
because I think we can use social media for ministry advancement, but I think we need to be careful that we've got the fingerprints of Christ on it far Amen. more than the fingerprints of self. Amen. And I'm, I'm very grieved at a lot of the self-promotion that I see in Christian social media that I, I think will sooner or later cost people true promotion because the truth is real promotion comes from the Lord. That's right. Amen. It doesn't come from us. It comes from the Lord. And most people don't get mad at me. This is a 65 year old talking from experience and a lot of it I've learned not by watching others, but by making these mistakes myself. Most people in ministry think they're better than what they are mm. and think they should have opportunities that they mm. don't have and feel that they're a franchise that nobody's really discovered and what a gift to the world it would be if somebody could really understand uh, the depth of our talents. And I, I tweeted uh, probably about a week ago or so, you're never as good as your fans say you are, but you're never as bad as your worst critics say you are. You're somewhere in between and anything that is accomplished is accomplished by the grace of God through us. Amen. And many people in ministry are talented and do have incredible gifts. But if you're not careful in walking in holiness and humility, your gifts will take you where your character can't keep you. That's right. Mm. And I see that in ministry all the time where ministers spend more time developing their promo, their brand, their gift, their talent, the way they carry themselves, their presentation. Everything is so polished and promoted that their ministry starts to take them to places that their character cannot keep them. And most people think short term when God thinks long term, the Bible said the righteous are like a tree mm. and hardwood trees like maple and oak and hemlock, etc. Hardwood trees don't grow fast. They grow slow, but they produce more fruit and they last longer and they weather bigger storms and they cast bigger shadows and so forth. I think many people are not patient enough to wait on the promotion of God. Mm -hmm. And the real key to promotion is not in self-promotion, but in self-crucifixion. Allow your life to become like Christ. Become a student of the Bible. Know the scriptures. I think when TJ was at North Point, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this would go back many, many years, but didn't I lay hands on you and prophesy that God was going to give you an ability to supernaturally memorize scripture? Would that be somewhere close to accurate, TJ? Yep, 100%. I remember it. And uh, what happened after that? Well, the Lord gave me an ability to retain scripture that's beyond my uh, actual intellect. <laughs> it's supernatural <laughs> because... Um, I, I used to not be able to memorize, you know, facts for tests and all that. And I wasn't, you know, having come out of a drug lifestyle and having smoked a lot of drugs and, you know, your brain kind of, they call it permafried in the drug world where your brain kind of slows down and stuff. But, and some people still think I am permafried, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but when you laid hands on me, it did something where I was able to retain supernaturally the scriptures and uh, couple that in with what you've always given me as advice in every sermon that I preach. Always uh, load your sermon up with scriptures and say no less than 50 scriptures. And always say, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. And because of that grace that was imparted to me, I'm able to do that. Uh, and I would say effortlessly. And it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with my own ability. It's I am what I am by the grace of God and by His grace alone. 
And that's why it's encouraging to other young evangelists that I tell them all the time because they say, you know, if they've come out of a life of drugs and alcohol or if they don't feel like they're necessarily the most gifted people to humanity, it doesn't matter. God is a master at uh, strengthening people's weaknesses, supplementing them by the anointing of God so that, like Paul, I can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And so that definitely changed course in, uh, the course of my life and uh, my ability to handle the scriptures and preach them for sure. So I, I, I am not in any way saying that it, it's wrong to uh, testify. It's not wrong in, in ministry to uh, share what God is doing or what God has done. But we should be very cautious that we're never boasting in self, that we're boasting in the Lord Amen. and what the Lord has done. And I think we, in this 21st century, who would have thought that selfies would fulfill Bible prophecy? <laughs> in a day and an age in which everybody does selfies and some ministries i don't know where they find the time to post <laughs> five to 50 pictures a day of themselves and their travels and what they're drinking and their cappuccino and on and on and on i don't know where people find the time to post <laughs> selfies as often as they do but i get a little irritated when i see ministries that social media is self-aggrandizement yes. and it's about me and who I am and where I'm at and what I've done. And I laid hands on so-and-so and they were healed. Even with testimonies of healing, you should be very careful that you say in the service, uh, as the word of God was preached, you have to be very careful that you don't put too much of your DNA into the testimony of what God is doing because you almost, you know, I think of two or three that are running through my mind as I speak that I'll not call out by name, but <laughs> it just seems like everything they do in social media is promoting them. And, mm. uh, you know, you know, last night in my service, 42 people came in wheelchairs that stood up and, and walked. You know, well, let me tell you something. 95% that are of people that are in wheelchairs can walk. Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. 95% of people that are in wheelchairs can walk. They're not total cripples. They're not paralyzed from the middle of their back down or from the waist down. Many of them have gone through an it's operation true. or they're weak and, but if you force them up out of the wheelchair, you know, they can walk a little bit and, uh, you know, pulling people out of wheelchairs and, and demanding that they walk and they hobble off balance uh, for 10 yards and hobble off balance back to their wheelchair and claiming that you had miracles that, you know, you better be careful it's true. as to what you're doing because it's self-aggrandizement mm -hmm. and it's not a documented miracle. Yeah. If it's a real miracle, I would rather see somebody say, you know, once every three months, here's a testimony of someone that was truly crippled. Yes. Uh, like to go to Brian Tom's church and uh, we had an incredible move of God. I never even laid hands on the man. He was just in the prayer line in his wheelchair and had been paralyzed from his waist down, I think maybe mid back down for 20 some years, his legs had atrophied. And that man, I mean, he was in the prayer line, but I didn't even lay hands on him. I was just headed his way as I was praying for people in the line. And he got up out of that wheelchair and stood there. And, you know, he wasn't walking, but when I saw him get up out of the wheelchair, you know, I took him and I walked with him. You know, the last I heard, that man has never been Thank back you, in that wheelchair. Praise and God. Uh, I wish I could say that his spiritual life had continued to progress. It's amazing how some people can have a mighty miracle and God do something so notable in their life. And within a matter of years, they begin to forget about it and 
and can fade back into sin or into uh, unsafe friends and, and those types of things. But I think we need a real reminder that everything that is done needs to be given careful attention to the Christ of Calvary and that we don't spread our fingerprints on everything and talking about everything that we've done. Now, obviously, like I said, it's impossible in your ministry not to share what God has done. You're going to have to testify at some point. But I'm talking about individuals that it becomes clear that it's all about them and it's very little about Christ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me, myself, and I, those people are like comets. They'll flash through the sky and they'll burn and drop never to be heard from again. The righteous are like a tree. It took me 38 years to the best of my ability. It took me 38 years of my life preaching two to 300 times a year to preach to a million people. Wow. Think of that. 38 years preaching two to 300 times a year before I actually had the ability to even preach to a million people. Wow. But through the promotion of God, now a YouTube video reaches a million people in less than three days. Only God can do that. Yes. But I'm 65. It didn't happen overnight. And so I think we need to be patient and always remember God thinks long term, man thinks short term. We always want the drive through version of God's promotion. We want to go to an altar like a McDonald's, get in the speaker of God's face, tell him what we want, how we want it, and go to the window and pick it up and start living in that in a matter of days or weeks when God is more interested in building the character of That's the right. man Absolutely. or the woman. And through the character of the ministry, God then promotes automatically. Promotion happens automatically. You don't have to pursue it. You don't have to ask for it. It is the promise of God. If we'll bow low, he'll send us high. Praise God. That's awesome. That was excellent. We have a question, another question for someone in the studio, and uh, Raph, we'll put the lights on here and get you in there. How many of you are enjoying tonight's session with Evangelist Tiff? These are what we call solid gold nuggets, and uh, I, I hope you brought a notebook and write these, these things down, because uh, it'll, it'll greatly help you as you move forward in the ministry. Here we got our question here. Name and question. My name is Marc Henry. And my question is, what advice do you have for a Bible student? Bible school student. Bible school. Yes. Well, that's actually quite easy because when I talk about ministry and I talk about promotion, everything God does in your life and in your ministry will be directly connected to your knowledge of the Bible. If People are weak in the word. They will always have weak ministries with weak results. Everything God does in your life will be directly connected to your disciplines to study and to learn and to know the scriptures. That's why Paul, the great apostle, took his protege in the ministry, whom he loved like his own child, and said, Timothy, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, because that's where the power in ministry is. The power in ministry is not in social media. It's not in followers. It's not in clicks. It's not in views. The real lasting power of the ministry is in your ability to know the Bible to speak the Bible, to communicate the Bible with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the fire of God, making it a living letter that transforms lives. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. 
And uh, I heard, I think it was TJ moments ago that said that I encouraged him to have no fewer than 50 verses in a sermon. I, I try not to be legalistic with that. I don't sit down at the end of every message and count how many verses, <laughs> but between passages that I read and verses that I read and verses that I quote during the Bible, uh, anybody that's one of my students, you've heard me say it a hundred times or more, the recipe to powerful ministry, start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish and in the Bible. finish in the Bible. You'll never go wrong staying in the Bible, but you need to be a good theologian. And I'm a student as much now as I ever have been, uh, you know, behind me, and I didn't plan it that way. Almost all of those books that are behind me, I'm sitting tonight in my personal house. This is not my library. But almost all of those books that are behind me have been purchased probably in the last year or two. Uh, I constantly have books that I'm purchasing and reading and studying and continually keep yourself in the Word. And the more you know the Bible, the more God will use you. And those, you know, we've all heard preachers who either don't use the Bible or they'll read a verse many times out of context. And the next 40 minutes, you're listening to them run about and thrash and sweat and scream and spit. And it's all personal commentary and stories and <laughs> very little Bible. The power of preaching is in the Bible. Start in the Bible stay in the Bible and finish in the Bible. And you're not a Bible college student for a year or for a two-year associate's degree or a yeah. four-year BA in theology or your master's degree. You know, I'm 65 years old and I study the Bible more now than I ever have. And I Thank hope you, that Lord. increases with every passing year. Praise God. Thank you. We had one person here on... Uh the live stream that asked a question a little bit. Where's my mouse? Just give me that mouse. Did this thing die? Well, it's not working. My mouse is not working. But essentially the question was around uh, when preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, is it necessary to absolutely cover the deity of Jesus in order for people to be saved? That was the essence of the question. Well, I, I think I'll give you some, uh, I mean, not that I have the right to do so, but uh, I'll give you some preaching coaching advice. One of the biggest mistakes that I see with young evangelists is they try to cover too much ground mm -hmm. in one service. That's good, yeah. Uh, you can't get everybody saved, everybody healed, everybody baptized in the Holy Spirit, everybody straightened out in their morals, all of their marriages fixed, make them perfect parents and straighten out their finances and show them the path to joy. You can't do everything in one service. Yeah. So I try to do one thing in each service. Yes. And the deity of Christ is one of the systematic theologies. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't have any problem with somebody preaching on the deity of Christ, but you don't always have to preach on the deity of Christ in every service. Let me give you an example. I was at a, a very large church. Some might call it a mega church. It certainly was in its day. And the pastor had told me, it was my first time I ever preached there, and he was very strict. He was German. And in his office prior to the service, he told me, he said, we get out at 12 o'clock, not 1201, <laughs> not 1202, 12 o'clock. Have I made myself clear? I said, no problem. He said, we'll get you the service at 1135. So you'll have about 25 minutes to preach and to give your invitation and so on. Well, when he said that, his whole board was in the office with us before we prayed and went to the platform. They turned the service over to me, 
at nine minutes to 12, right before <laughs> I went up to the platform to preach, he whispered in my ear as he walked by me, feel free to go to a quarter after 12. I thought in my mind when he said it, I'm not going to a quarter after 12. Yeah. Because all of your deacons that were in the office heard you say, not 1201, not 1202. And your deacons didn't hear you whisper in my ear 1215. So if I go one minute past 12, let alone quarter after, all of your deacons sitting with their family and their wives are going to begin to whisper how I disrespected your authority. Right. So I didn't have time to explain that to him. But I thought, I'm not, I'm, I'm done at 12 o'clock. I'm done. And so as I'm walking to the pulpit, I'm wrestling in my mind, what can I do in nine minutes? <laughs> and so I walk to the platform. Now, this is my first service with this strict, well-known Assembly of God presbyter with one of the largest churches in his district in New York City. And I opened my Bible and I said, this morning, I'm going to speak on what must you do to go to hell. And I paused and I said, absolutely nothing. Stand to your feet with me, please. <laughs> and I literally took eight minutes to give my invitation. But that was my message that morning. Wow. What must you do? To, and I have never done it before. I've never done it since. <laughs> The most important thing to me as an evangelist is calling people to salvation. And so obviously that was the shortest message I've preached in 45 plus years with the least amount of theology, no apologetics, no <laughs> eschatology, no pneumatology, barely soteriology. <laughs> what must you do to go to hell? Absolutely nothing. Stand to your feet with me, please. But that dramatic pause, I, I gave the invitation and the altar is filled. Now, I've preached what I would have considered strong theological messages, evangelistic messages that had lesser results. But that morning, I was forced into a corner and God will meet you uh, where you're at. That's not the rule. That's the exception. I say all of that to say this, don't worry about how many of the 10 systematic theologies you're going to squeeze in your Sunday morning sermon. Find one thing, preach it well, fill it with the scripture. The main thing is when you go to a platform, you need to walk onto that platform well prepared. Like a lot of people would never know this. Of the 400 and some videos that are on my YouTube channel, I've probably put six to 12 or more hours into every single video, oh. studying, researching, writing, editing, re-editing. And then with all of that manuscript that I prepare, then I make a Cliff Notes version of it for YouTube, and I try to commit most of it to memory. But every single YouTube video represents six to 12 or more hours of my life. Every time you walk into the sacred desk, there's no excuse for not being well prepared and prayed up. You should always walk to the sacred desk well studied, well prepared, and well prayed up. Because when a minister walks onto a platform that's not prepared and hasn't prayed, the Holy Spirit immediately walks off. And you don't ever want to be at the sacred desk without the Holy Spirit anointing what you're doing and saying and thinking. That's powerful. One thing that you uh, told me, I remember I had just finished preaching, and I think I, it was, I was very young in the ministry, and I had jumped around the Bible a lot, and I preached a lot of scriptures, but you, you told me something that changed my um, sermon structures from that day onward, and you said, it's better to preach one point ten different ways than to preach ten different things 
one with uh, 10 different points one way. Sorry, better to preach one point 10 different ways than to preach 10 different things one way. And that helped me because it allowed me to, first of all, search the Bible topically and then drive home a point in 10 different ways that would appeal to def 10 different people because not everyone's going to receive the same way and certain ways you say certain things can actually click with certain people over other people and so it, it actually helped my overall preaching and my meetings to just center in and it helped me in even arriving to the pulpit because sometimes you're I got to preach this 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 and it overwhelms you and you feel like you're being crushed mm -hmm. but if you just stick to I'm preaching on this tonight what I want to do is communicate this one Bible truth I'm going to use a litany of scriptures and preach it 10 different ways, but this one Bible truth is going to be communicated articulately, passionately, powerfully, and uh, accurately with integrity to the Bible. And that helped me a lot. That did help me a lot. We have another question in studio here with uh, one of our GNU students. There she, there she is. Name and... And I was wondering if there is one book you would highly recommend for a Bible school student that impacted your ministry and helped you develop the right character for a minister of God. Wow. One book. It's a good question. Well, obviously, <laughs> I've always said through the years, uh, spend more time reading the Bible than books about the Bible. There is, you know, if, if you've got one book, the Bible's it. Uh, I think sometimes we underestimate the true supernatural power that's in the Bible. And the Bible is the only book that you read and study and meditate upon that heals your body as you're reading it. Thy word is health to my flesh. It heals the mind yeah. and expands the mind. If any man lacks wisdom, let them ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally. And that word men is generic in the original Greek, means both male and female. It imparts wisdom and counsel and guidance. Uh, it gives you the ability to live in victory over sin. Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It creates blessing and provision for everything that you're doing. Uh, no good thing will I withhold from them that walk uprightly. There is no book above the Bible, and I, I don't want that to sound trite because I'm not wanting it to sound trite. Um, if I had to put, uh, pick one book, I will say this. When it comes to eschatology and Bible prophecy, the one book I would highly recommend, above all, is a fairly new book written by Dr. Mark Hitchcock entitled The End. Uh, few messages outside of Bible prophecy motivate people to live holy, like knowing the Lord could come tonight. That offers a real passion and motivation to live ready, to live right, uh, so probably if I were going to recommend a book, I would recommend the Bible, number one. I would recommend a book called The End by Dr. Mark, Mark Hitchcock as uh, number two. You're welcome. There's a question here Make online. Genetic. Sorry, there's a question here online that I actually would like to know. Um, All right. I don't know if I've ever asked you this, but I would love to know this uh, from Natasha. I won't try to pronounce your last name, <laughs> but Bittner. <laughs> Knowing what you know now, what would you say to yourself when you first started the ministry? Don't worry hmm. about all of the things you think you need in life. I think when people start out in ministry, you know, Judy and I, you know, I got married right out of Bible college. 
Judy and I were homeless the first four years. And uh, in those early years, and, you know, part of it's just being, you know, a real man, you know, being raised that a, a man provides and a man takes care of his spouse and a man takes care of his children. And I lived with a great amount of uh, guilt and feelings of failure in those early years. Uh, because it was so hard to get started. Now, it didn't help that when Judy and I started out in evangelism shortly thereafter, one of the largest scandals in the history of Christianity <laughs> took place. And within a couple of years, uh, a scandal that was worse than that took place, both of which the press called evangelists. <laughs> and so evangelism, when Judy and I started out in evangelism, was actually like a profanity and I'm not talking about in the world, it was like a profanity in the evangelical circles. And people didn't have evangelists for a lot of years just because of what a bruise that was and what a sore yeah. spot that was. But I remember in those early days, you know, my first year married, traveling full time, uh, our total offerings for the first year were just over $3,300 total offerings for the year, $3,300 wow. with a car payment of $178 a month <laughs> and gas higher then than it is now under the Jimmy Carter era, four, five, six, seven dollars a, a, a gallon. <laughs> and that's uh, crazy. You know, we, we literally were homeless. We never slept under a bridge, but you know, we didn't have a home. We didn't have a trailer. We didn't have a pull behind trailer. We, we literally were trusting God for every meal, every gallon of, of gasoline, every provision. And I think that's not uncommon when people start out in ministry. I think if you're not careful, you get consumed with, you know, getting a good vehicle. Where am I going to live? Where will my first apartment be? Where will my first house be? You know, what about clothes? Uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to buy a nice piece of jewelry for my wife and our anniversary and <laughs> Christmas for the kids. And I, I think a lot of ministries spend a lot of time worrying about those things. Yeah. And they really, they've heard it said, but sometimes they don't really learn to walk it out until they're older what Matthew 6.33 really means. Seek ye first Hallelujah. the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. God knows about the stuff, and God knows about the things. When it says all these things, that's temporary stuff. God cares about temporary stuff. Yeah. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. But it said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That would be what I would pass on to young ministers, is thoroughly baptize yourself in the pool of understanding eternal values and focus upon eternal values. Mm. And automatically, the rest of that stuff is added when you're totally committed to the eternal call, the eternal word, the eternal value, the eternal souls, things that are stamped with eternity, put your focus into that and all of the other stuff automatically happens. Not one bit of worry adds anything to your life. Not That's one right. yeah. wrestling anxiety adds anything to your life. Those things will come, and not that you neglect them, not that you don't manage and steward them, but I, I carried a lot of guilt and feelings of failure and probably didn't walk that through as much as I should have in the early days. I was talking to Evangelist Wesley and my wife um, as he's been here these last couple of days, and I, we've been thinking about how there's an element of now, I don't want to use this word because a lot of it's like attributed, it's a negative thing, but there's an element of risk 
in following the call of God. Now, not the human risk in that when you step out for God, like you're risking your life, you're being, you're being foolish, it's not going to work out. I mean that there is in the natural, in the natural, just all things equal and everything, uh, people that would be carnally minded and people that would be naturally minded, seeing you, you know, leave a job to pursue full-time ministry, go to Bible college, seeing you give up something great, seeing you, you know, there's people that uh, were going to be great athletes that ended up going to Bible college. I know for you, you had, you had the ability to go to a Division I school for golf, and you could have gone far in golf, and, but you gave it all up. And it seems to naturally minded people or carnally minded people like the most foolish thing. And there's people I'm sure watching online and maybe some of you in studio where you've had to battle that even in your own family. Because not everyone grew up in a Holy Ghost family where everybody knows, you know, everybody's in the ministry and they're all encouraging you. Some people grew up in min uh, families where, you know, they're not even saved. And to see you step out of the boat and just saying things like, no, God's going to provide. You look like you're crazy. Mm -hmm. You look like there's a, a risk in what you're doing. Uh, would you say that to fully walk in everything God's called you to do, that there is that initial consecration, wholehearted throwing of oneself into the holy task that God's called them to, be, uh, to do, that is required in order for doors to open, the blessing to come, and uh, things to just work. Because I've seen a lot of people, you know, and I'm not against like bivocational ministers for a time being. I don't believe though that some, I've never seen it, someone who uh, after a decade or two decades is still bivocational and their ministry is exploding or their church is thriving. That there is a moment where God does require everything from you. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, listen carefully, because I certainly don't preach uh, a God of suffering. But I am going to say something, and I, uh, then I'll, I'll unfold it a little bit. The strength is in the struggle. And I think my experience is that when most ministries launch, God allows you to go through boot camp. Hmm. And I think, you know, the Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. Almost every ministry is going to start in a small place. Yeah. Especially if you're young. You know, pastors are not sitting by their phones at nine o'clock in the morning <laughs> thinking, Oh, how I wish a 20-year-old that just graduated from Bible <laughs> college would call me today and give me the answers on how I can be a successful pastor. Yeah. When you're young, you don't have that right, and you earn your stripes, so to speak. But there probably would be certain members of my family that would disagree uh, with this, but I'm just saying from my heart, I think you do a disservice to people not to let them struggle when they're struggling. Hmm. I didn't want, like when my son entered ministry and came on with Lost Lamb, and, you know, I actually made uh, a mistake that I'll openly uh, admit. Uh, when Jonathan got out of school, he became my first associate evangelist. And uh, he strongly encouraged me to hire some individuals, which I did out of the goodness of my heart. But the truth is, the ministry wasn't in a position financially. We had just built our first 6,000 square foot corporate office. Uh, the overhead was higher at that time than it had ever been. Uh, I really wasn't financially in a position to do what I did. I, I did it by faith. Looking back on it, you know, when you listen to uh, my son preach, you would think that that we didn't pay him anything at all. And the and the truth is, we we certainly didn't do what I wish I could have done. But 
it did put him in a position where he was facing some struggles that I actually didn't find out about until a little later uh, in life through his preaching. But if you'll listen to him preach, he and Adalus really learned to trust God and saw some answers to prayer and miracles and provision yeah. that came out of some of those times of hardship. Again, I didn't plan it that way. I was doing the best that I could do, but I had myself, Judy. I had a full-time executive assistant by the name of Adana. I had uh, Jonathan. Shortly thereafter, I had Jessica. I had uh, two young men. Uh, I overextended myself for where the ministry actually was and you know we went through times of of some struggles uh through that uh through that growth of the ministry but there's strength in the struggle uh every you know in the united states of america we have what are called the seal team mm -hmm. and the seal team is an elite group of warriors and to become a seal you go through a training time that I think only one out of every 300 survive. And the entire SEAL training is based on struggle and suffering and pain and challenges and difficulties. And again, I don't believe that's what God longs to do in people's lives. But I think many ministries go through a birth pain process where until the ministry is actually birthed, there are struggles. And especially in evangelism, trying to find meetings and to find pastors that'll give a young man or a young woman an opportunity. And there aren't as many of them now as there used to be, but it's always been difficult don't despise the struggle because those struggles, you know, my four years with Judy and being homeless in those tough times and thinking in my mind, I'll never own a home and medical bills with Jessica and some heart issues that she had and so on and so forth. The devil had almost convinced me that I'd never own a home, mm -hmm. let alone the home that I'm sitting in now. But it was in those struggles that mm -hmm. I probably prayed different. I learned to pray at a different level. I learned to fast because I needed to fast for breakthroughs, etc. There was an iron that was put in my spirit in the early days of struggling to give birth to the ministry that no doubt make me who I am today. And again, I, I don't preach a God of suffering but almost every ministry that I've ever seen that God uses in, in great ways, they went through a time of small beginnings and tough times and having to trust God for a tank of gas and the next place to preach and almost all of them. And you listen to R.W. Shambach stuff. You listen to A.A. A. Allen stuff. You listen to Lester Semrall stuff. You listen to Reinhard Bonnke stuff. You listen to Billy Graham. I mean, on and on and on. I don't know of a single person that God has used in a great way that didn't go through a birthing season yes. of some struggles that taught them how to trust God in ways they probably never would have trusted God. And when I hear of people saying, you know, my kids aren't going to struggle. I'm going to give them everything they need. I sometimes just smile and say, well, I guess we'll see how that works out. Because I've seen people in ministry where everything was handed to them. I've never seen a great ministry. I repeat, I've never seen a great ministry where everything was handed to them. Yeah. Almost every great ministry I know of, they went through hell sideways and fought and struggled and faith and prayed and fasted and broke through and learned how to fight. Paul said, I fought a good 
fight, I kept my faith. There is no without a fight. And sometimes God, again, I don't believe he's the author of suffering, but I do believe when ministries start, I think God sometimes allows ministries to face struggles and battles and see how they're going to walk through that. Are they going to be a whiner or are they going to be a winner? Are they going to be a complainer or are they going to be a confessor? Yes. And you get up every day and you roll up your sleeves and you do the best you can and the struggle will never hurt you. The struggle produces a strength that sometimes doesn't come any other way. And most ministries that remember the struggle, if they keep it wrapped in humility, they'll carry that all the days of their life. Hallelujah. And they'll never forget where they came from. And if you'll never forget where you came from, you'll never have to worry about where God's going to take you. Praise Hallelujah. God. Praise God. Well, Evangelist Tiff, I feel the power of God in this studio right now, just as you've said those words. And I think there's a lot of people I can just see their faces and the Lord's touching their hearts. I think it would be an appropriate time if, if you can pray for those that are watching online and those in studio and pray um, whatever the Lord leads in your spirit to pray for. And if you're in studio, if you're watching online, just lift your hands as he prays. And Hallelujah. Well, for all that are listening, those that are in studio, those that are online, and maybe the thousands, who knows? You never know if this might go viral. And you almost have to assume today that the greatest audience that you'll speak to is not listening to you live. They'll listen in the days ahead. But the first thing that I would ask you is, are you living ready to meet the Lord? Because not everybody that goes to church is a Christian. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Reading a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, going to a Bible college or a seminary doesn't make you a Christian. Praying doesn't make you a Christian. There has to be a time in your life when you do three things. If you're going to be right with God, I'm talking about biblically right with God. I'm not talking about religious. I'm talking about being right with God. The Bible says you have to do three things. Number one, you have to admit your sin. There has to be a time in your life when you come into the presence of a holy God and own up to your sin and tell him, Father, I, I violated the commandments. I've done stuff that grieved your heart. I've sinned. B, you have to believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The only way to have right relationship with God is you have to place your faith in Christ and the cross, and the blood that was shed, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his promise to return. And then number three is you have to commit your heart to him by faith. Three things you have to do. The ABCs of making peace with God. A, admit your sin. B, believe in Jesus Christ. C, commit your heart to him by faith. So my first prayer is that if you're not right with God, or if you once knew the Lord, but you're not living in victory over sin, sin's living in victory over you, and you need to come back home, pray this with me wherever you're at. Just say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to truth and to the Bible, you were speaking to me. And down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian, I admit my sin. God, you know everything I've ever done. I trust in the cross and in the blood that was shed. Cleanse my mind, my body, and my spirit and make me clean. I receive salvation today as the gift of God, and I commit my heart to you. In childlike faith, I vow right now, I will serve you all the days of my life. Keep me ready for your soon return. In Jesus' name, I am no longer under the curse of sin. I am today a child of God. 
and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to go down into the comments section and just write something like, Tiff, I prayed that prayer and I meant business with God. And let TJ know. And they'll follow up with you at Salvation Now Ministries. Or you can go to lostlam.org at our ministry and get in touch with us there. But I also want to take time to pray with all of you that were a part of this evangelism summit. Because I genuinely believe that we're living in the final moments of human history. And I do believe that God wants to raise up a holy army of young men and young women who will commit themselves to evangelism, to reaching the lost, reaching the unreached. There is no greater cause than winning the lost. And I wonder if you'll sense the call of God and say, God, I'll go through whatever that struggle is to be birthed into the call of God, to be birthed into my lane of ministry, to be birthed into whatever it is that you have before me, whatever it costs me, I will pay the price because there is a price to the supernatural and not everyone is willing to pay it. The Bible said that some are called and the truth is some just went without being called. You need to be called. You need to fight through the battle of knowing that you're called. And then once you've established that, you need to adopt an attitude. There's no turning back. Yes. I will never quit. I will never give up. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm going to be a man of God or I'm Jesus. going to be a woman of God. And if you sense the touch of the Holy Spirit making those words personal to you right now, wherever you might be, I want you to pray with me and I'm going to pray with you. Heavenly Father, we pray for the call of God that in these last days that you would, by the Holy Spirit, raise up an army of young men and young women who are separated unto the Lord who embrace holiness and righteousness, who are filled with the Holy Spirit and walk with the fire of God unashamed. And I pray that you would indeed equip them with the sword of the Spirit and give them the ability to rightly divide the word of truth. Let the call of God go out even now in Jesus' mighty name. And may many who hear this teaching and this time we've spent together walk away with a yes in their heart to do the work and the will and the ways of God. We pray in Jesus' name according to Luke's gospel. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up laborers to send into the harvest. Lord, we pray that tonight, raise up a holy army of young men and young women to do the work of God in these last days before it's eternally too late. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. amen. and amen. Amen. Those of you that are in the province of Quebec, uh, right there in Montreal, my son-in-law and my daughter at Good News Chapel have a great Bible college called Good News University. And if you're anywhere in that area or in Canada and you have an opportunity to connect with them, I can guarantee you that they will train you and equip you to become men and women of God. Hey. If you're in the United States, I serve currently as the president of North Point Bible College and Seminary. As I mentioned earlier, my mom and dad met on the original campus in 1949. All of my brothers, including myself, attended there, met our spouses, Jonathan, Adalis, Jessica, Pastor Steve, all attended there. 
If you're in the United States and you would like to attend a Bible college, I would love to have the privilege of mentoring you and being a part of your training and ministry. We are a full gospel Pentecostal Bible college that is what is called single purpose. We only train ministers and we believe in the gifts of the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher. At North Point, we train God's special forces. And as president, I would love to welcome you there and be a part of your training for ministry. If you have any questions, you can go to northpoint.edu if you're stateside and we'd love to help you or other places of the world. We have online as well. Whatever you do, say yes to the call of God and give him your all and win men and women and boys and girls to Jesus and do it well unto his soon coming. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, Wesley, for letting me be a part of this. Thank you so much for uh, taking this time out of your, your night and your busy schedule. I know you're the busiest you've ever been, <laughs> and uh, the Lord's given you grace, and we love you very much, and we're so grateful for your voice in our life and uh, your wisdom and your guidance and uh, your presence. And so I just want to, from Wesley and myself and everyone here in studio, thank you so much, Evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth. We honor you, and uh, we love you. By the way, university students, uh, our teaching on the theology of a public invitation. And uh, just give me an idea as to numbers and get a hold of me later, uh, Brother TJ, and I'll send those along as a gift. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, people, people, that, that's like a rare CD, and it's not on YouTube, but it's like gold. It's absolute gold. Yeah, I need to put that on YouTube, don't I? That, that would go viral. If it's just me, it you'll have a million views. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I love you. I'll text you when we're done here. All right. God Say hi to Judy. You, everyone. Say hi to Judy and give uh, Biscuit a hug. He's <laughs> laying at my feet as we speak. <laughs> God bless you. You too. Stay connected with us by visiting us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching at TJ Malkanji. Or visit us online, www.salvationnow.ca. God bless you, and until next time.